Victorious Iranian troops display captured Iraqi prisoners while crowds in Tehran celebrate a major victory by the forces of the Ayatollah Khomeini. Good evening. Iraq claimed still to be fighting Iranian troops near the city of Karamshah today, but did not dispute Iran's claim that it had recaptured the key port yesterday. Iraq's military command said it planes had attacked Iranian positions north of the city and claimed that its troops had killed 238 Iranians. At the United Nations here in New York, Secretary General Perez de Cuellar made a new appeal to Iraq and Iran to end their 20-month-old war. That war appeared to take a decisive turn yesterday when Iran said it had taken back Khoramshar, captured by Iraq early in the fighting. The success of the Ayatollah's troops has raised fears of new instability in the Gulf region. Conservative oil-producing Gulf states are reported to fear that Iran might press on into Iraq and open the way for Iran's Shiite Muslims to spread their militancy. But the new twist in the fighting also has broader implications touching the United States and the Soviet Union. Tonight, the impact of Iran's victory. Jim? Robin, who is on whose side in this war has been a tangled, confused web since the beginning, since Iraqi artillery opened fire on an Iranian-held border town in September 1980. The U.S. position has been mostly one of neutrality, although then-President Carter did deplore Iraq's aggression, despite the fact that Iran was still holding 53 American hostages at the time. A formal position of neutrality has been maintained by the Reagan administration. But the pressure to take sides has been great. From Israel, which considers both Iran and Iraq enemies, but Iraq the worst of the two, thus has reportedly been providing arms to Iran, and in doing so, finding itself in company with one of Israel's other arch enemies, Syria. Syria is virtually alone among Arab states in supporting Iran. All of the rest are on Iraq's side, particularly Jordan and Saudi Arabia. They have been urging the United States to support Iraq, too. And finally, just to complicate things more, there's the Soviet Union. It has been supplying arms to both sides. It had an arms agreement with Iraq when the war started, but it also didn't want to alienate Iran. In other words, nothing simple for anyone concerning this war. Robin? First this evening, Iran's point of view. The senior Iranian diplomat in the United States is their ambassador to the United Nations, Saeed Rajai. Mr. Ambassador, first of all, do you have late news of the situation in Karamshah? Is there still fighting around it, do you know? I think there is no fighting around Karamshah. I believe some of the people have already returned back to Karamshah, and the city is uh, under complete control. Uh, the police station is set up already, and uh, it's going to be very active soon, by the grace of God. Will Iran's troops, now that they have made such a tremendous recovery of the land, will they now stop at Iraq's border, or are they going to push further in? I wish every audience of, of, of mine could put himself in the, in the shoes of all the Iranians. Uh, I wish they, uh, in here, uh, could think of a foreign enemy who might have just attacked the United States and occupied an important part of the country, and then the people of the United States offer uh, a lot of uh, austerities and, and uh, hardship uh, would have been able to push the enemy back. Then what would they do at the borders? Would they say, well, welcome, thank you very much? Or they would have further arguments to be settled? Will those further arguments involve uh, pushing on and invading Iraq? Uh, these arguments are basically satisfaction of the conditions we produced at the beginning of the war, and we have been uh, 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 abiding by them and sticking to them constantly. We said that uh, the Iraqi troops must withdraw without any condition. This condition can no more be satisfied because they, uh, they were expelled uh, from the country by force, or some of them are already uh, captives inside the country. So uh, this condition is... Uh, they can't withdraw Somehow voluntarily they anymore. They can't withdraw right. voluntarily anymore. Uh, the second condition was uh, reparation of the war. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, uh, we have been uh, aggressed by the Iraqi forces. We believe that the imperialist forces inside the area, and particularly outside the area, uh, the, 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 at the top of, of which you know who 
uh, is. Uh, they have been no, I, I don't. Who what are you I referring to? You. We believe that the United States uh, is responsible for all the uh, tension and problems and uh, casualties and, and what is happening to us and to, Iraq, to the Iraqi people because Saddam Hussein started this war uh, under the instigation of the United States. Can I stop you there and ask a couple yes, of questions? Uh, the reparations, uh, will you demand those only of Iraq or other countries you believe involved? Uh, we believe some other countries also have been involved in the war, but we take it from Iraq. Of course, others can assist Iraq right. in uh, peace as they have been others assisting it in Others could help or pay the reparations. Yes. Uh, those reparations, I have seen huge sums mentioned, figures like $150 billion. Are you talking of sums of that magnitude? I do not have an exact number to give you, but I can uh, uh, assure you that some of the losses are just priceless. For instance, there was a dome in Hueza. You may already know that the city of Hueza is totally exploded by the Iraqi troops before they evacuate from the city. Now, in the city, there was uh, a dome, a very ancient dome, known to the people as the Dome of Ishmael. It is exploded. It is a great historical monument. It was a great religious place. You cannot replace it, no matter how many billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Many old mosques have been destroyed. Uh, well, a great hospital in the area has been destroyed. Hospitals, schools, libraries, departments uh, of, of the... Uh, so you're going you know, to make government. Iraq pay, in other words. These things can be replaced, but some of the monumental, uh, 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 let's say, uh, monumental historical uh, sites cannot be replaced at all. So we believe that Iraq, and particularly Saddam Hussein of Iraq, not the people of Iraq, is responsible for all these losses. Are you going losses. to insist that he be removed from power before you will make a peace treaty with uh, Iraq? This is also a very good question which can be put to the American people. They have to think that a foreign enemy has attacked their country and now he and uh, the foreign enemy has inflicted so many losses in lives and in material upon them and now he is going to go just beyond the border. What, do, what would they do? They would shake hand with him and say thank you. I think he must go. He must go. Jim? And your country will not stop and will not be satisfied until he is in fact gone. Is that correct, sir? I think we have a better choice in front of us. Uh, with uh, regard to very reliable news we have got from inside Iraq, uh, which tells us that uh, people in uh, Karbala, Najaf, Erbil, Soleimaniye and, and other cities are demonstrating. There have been shootings. Uh, two ladies have been killed and so many have been wounded. Therefore, the people of Iraq are quite in a position to, uh, to uh, handle the, the, the matter and overthrow the regime which has been imposed upon them. So you may not have to do it yourself. You think we the, don't people, need to will, do it the people of Iraq will do it themselves, Exactly. Right? There is another thing you which is to be taken into consideration. We have more than 100,000 Iraqi refugees in Iran, and uh, I think they have to go back. They have properties confiscated by the government, mm -hmm. and they have a lot to say to Mr. Saddam Hussein. Mr. Ambassador, the American people, of course, are used to uh, having people from Iran blame everything on the United States. Uh, but let me ask you, what is your evidence to your claim that the United States is responsible for Iraq's invasion of your country? Oh, it's very simple. You lo look at the papers today. When Saddam Hussein started his war against us, uh, everybody was uh, foreseeing that the Islamic Republic of Iran will collapse in a very near future in a day or so probably they would say. It was a very wishful thinking, uh, which fortunately never happened. But now when Saddam Hussein is falling, everybody has got so much concern for him and they want stability and peace. Uh, what is that peace that they never remembered when the war started? Well, my question though is what is your evidence that the United States was responsible for the initial military action taken by Iraq, sir? Well, uh, some of the information we have uh, we cannot, we just can tell the people, we cannot produce evidence uh, at this table here to them, but we have reliable information that Saddam Hussein started this war after consultation with authorities of the United States. Second, we know that all the pro-American regimes in the area have been actively participating in, in the war and assisting Saddam Hussein. We know some of the regimes cannot eat, drink water without the permission of the United States, and uh, they have been uh, very active in, in the war. Their soldiers are now captives. We have their tanks, uh, we have their uh, military hardware, uh, some of them undamaged. 
So uh, is, we know where they're coming from. Is it true, though, that one of the United States' major, uh, if not the major, ally in the Middle East, Israel, has in fact been uh, supplying your country with arms to fight Iraq? I think this is a, a sort of allegation which is produced in order to instigate the good feeling of the Arabs uh, and turn it into bad feelings against us. They know that uh, Israel, everybody knows that Israel is the greatest enemy of Islam and the greatest enemy of Arabs. So by uh, accusing, of, accusing us of this, they have been doing their best in order to distort and destroy our relations with our neighbors. And they are doing it now. They are threatening the Muslim people of the area from Islam. I think yes. it is the imperialism and Zionism that all the people in the area must be afraid of, not Islam because they are already Muslims but and very good uh, observant Muslims, I believe. Mr. Ambassador, to again repeat my question, has Israel in fact supplied arms to your country in this war against Iraq? No. Has, uh, what, what support have you received from Syria? Syria is one of the one countries that has supported you publicly, is that correct? Uh, we are an independent country and we have been under uh, economic sanction, different kind of sanctions. We have done our best to get uh, whatever we needed from the uh, market, free market, mm -hmm. but we have not had any relations uh, in this term with South Africa, with Israel, with Egypt, and with the United States. What about the Soviet Union, sir? The Soviet Union, so far as I know, there has been no uh, military assistance from the side of the Soviet Union. Fortunately enough, plenty of Soviet arms have been uh, taken from the Iraqis. If you remember when we uh, liberated the city of Boston, there we had access to enough tanks, lorries, and other military hardware and ammunition enough mm. for three complete months of the war all along the borders. And we still have them and we are using them. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Robin? Thank you. Now, another perspective. We were unable to obtain an Iraqi spokesman for this program. We get another perspective from Karen Elliott House, diplomatic correspondent of the Wall Street Journal. Ms. House has covered Arab politics extensively and returned only last week from a trip to Iraq. Ms. House, uh, what are the worries of the states around Iran now? Well, precisely what you alluded to earlier, that, uh, that even if the Iranians don't physically move into Iraq, that the enthusiasm of this victory is going to encourage them to try to spread their revolutionary view of uh, Islam into Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, other countries in the Gulf. Which countries are most worried? The ones you've just mentioned? Or? Yes, and obviously we're most worried about the Saudis. Are other Arab states committed to the survival of uh, Saddam Hussein of Iraq? I don't uh, think there's a whole lot of personal commitment to Saddam Hussein necessarily. I think uh, he's viewed as, at least as a, f as, uh, a figure of stability and thus to, to see him go, there is a fear that, that that would only encourage the Kurds in Iraq, the Shias versus the Sunnis, I mean all of the ethnic and religious tensions in that country to, uh, to expand. If Iran, which has the uh, most powerful military forces uh, in the area, at least in, in the, uh, except for Israel, if it uh, presses for reparations from Iraq, are other uh, states in the region likely to try to help Iraq meet them? I think... You heard uh, what the ambassador said earlier. Yes, uh, I, I, there's been talk about that even before the war reached this, uh, this critical point. The, Saudis, among others, are apparently uh, willing to help Iraq pay reparations, and there's been uh, rumors all over here in the last couple of days that Abu Dhabi has already transferred money to Iran. I mean, these are the sorts of things that it's very difficult to prove, um, but I think there's definitely a willingness. If money is all that stands in the way of a settlement that stops the Iranians, then uh, the Saudis will be happy to pay. You heard the ambassador say that there were signs of unrest uh, in Iraq against uh, Hussein, Saddam Hussein. Uh, does he appear secure to you? You were just in that country. Well, I, <laughs> I, it, it's, it's obviously extremely difficult to know. Um, I don't think, uh, I mean, he's been a rather uh, efficient leader at maintaining control and at eliminating his uh, enemies. Uh, some of whom were once his friends. Uh, so I think that it would be premature to assume that uh, in the next few days we're going to see Saddam Hussein out in the street. But uh, clearly this is not a happy day for him because he's been so personally identified with the war 
and uh, it must be uh, a bit like uh, Jimmy Carter the morning after the failure of the hostage rescue mission in Iran. If Saddam, you say people are talking of stability, if Saddam uh, Hussein falls, what will, or what, in what way is his survival important to the United States? I think only for the same reason that uh, the, the, some of the Arabs feel that it's important, simply because if you, if you have a change of leadership, it's likely to encourage and unleash other ambitions and efforts, and uh, for instance, the Kurds in Iraq, it, it could encourage their desires to seize the moment to, to uh, achieve autonomy, that you just, you feed the sense of instability in the country, and that in a time when uh, there's enough instability is not what you want. Well, thank you. Jim? Let's look at the so-called big power stake in all of this now. We get the perspective of William Olson of the Georgetown Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington. His specialty is the international politics and strategies concerning the Persian Gulf region. If Iran does, in fact, end up winning this war as it looks like it's going to, what would that mean for the United States and its interests? Well, the, uh, the whole situation in the Middle East as a result of the Iran-Iraq war has been a nettle for the United States uh, because it's been put in the position of, after the fall of the Shah, of losing whatever influence it had in Iran and of having ab virtually no influence uh, in Iraq. And as a result, the United States is now in the position of uh, two countries at war in an area of vital concern to the United States but have no leverage to exercise its influence in the area. This is, of course, very worrying to, to, to deal with because of the threat to the Saudis uh, and of oil. You heard what the ambassador said, his uh, charge that the United States actually precipitated this whole thing on the part of Iraq. Does that have a ring of truth to you? Um, from an Iranian perspective, probably so. I don't think that it's a very realistic one, no. The United States uh, has nothing to gain from this kind of uh, promotion of Iraq, and the United States did not have this kind of influence in Iraq. Uh, the Soviet Union had the influence uh, and uh, the Treaty of Friendship with Iraq, and they might have restrained mm -hmm. Iraq, but I don't think that even they could have stopped the Iraqis from, uh, from moving. This was something that was done purely for local motives, uh, and uh, there's very little that can be done by a superpower in this kind of situation. There was nothing the United States could have done to influence events in this, you're saying, even, even the course of the last 20 months of the war? Well, that's the, been one of the real problems with the United States, uh, is that uh, we have had few levers of power in the area. Uh, we have no military forces to influence uh, the region. Uh, our inability to do anything about the hostage situation, I think, is a, is a key of, of how uh, uh, low the uh, American ability has sunk to, to affect interests or uh, events in the area. So just in terms of the region, you would agree with Karen, then, that the main threat to U.S. interests is just the instability that this will cause, right? That's, that's one of the principal sources of, yeah. of concern, yeah. Well, let's talk about the Soviet Union now. Uh, what are the wins and what are the potential wins and losses that it could get from this? Well, the, the principal gain at the moment for the Soviet Union is the fact of the destruction of American uh, interest in Iran. Uh, this was a, a real plus for the Soviet Union, and it gives them an opportunity to inject their interest into the area by helping, uh, in this case, the Iranians, because I believe the uh, Soviet Union sees Iran as the strategic key to the area, and by providing what services they can to Iran, they can hope to increase their influence. Uh, now, there are some chances that this might cost them in the area because of, uh, of alienating the Arab states, but the problem at the moment is that the Arabs themselves are divided over the issue of the Iran-Iraq war. And you have the regional states, of course, supporting Iraq, but you, uh, but you have Syria, uh, Libya, uh, Algeria, uh, the PLO, uh, and Yemen all supporting um, the Iranians in this situation. So it's divided the Arab community as well. Uh, and this means the Soviet Union can try to then uh, sail between these interests uh, and increase its total influence in the area by uh, relations with Iran. But most, but most likely by siding more firmly with Iran rather than Iraq. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they have a treaty of friendship with Iraq, which they have not lived up to. They have not provided the kind of facilities to Iraq that one would have expected of, uh, of a loyal ally. 
And there were, uh, over the years, uh, uh, the last few years, there been a deterioration in the Soviet-Iraqi relationship. And with the fall of the Shah, the Soviets, I believe, saw an opportunity. Uh, mm. This was a target of opportunity. And similar to the incidents in the, in the Horn of Africa, uh, and the relationship between Ethia Ethiopia and Somalia, the, the Soviets shifted ground and went to the power they thought was more influential in the region. I know this is a very difficult question, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Uh, looking ahead, <clears throat> with all the considered ifs that you want to add into it, do you see, as a result of what's happened to this Iran-Iraqi war and the conclusion that it looks like it's headed for causing some kind of major confrontation between the United States and the Soviet Union? It certainly has this potential. Uh, one is concerned that this might be our Balkan situation, uh, prelude, to the prelude to the First World War sort of situation. The confrontation of the two powers uh, over extremely important strategic interests to both sides in a situation in which they cannot back down. The problem at the, for the, at the moment for the United States in the region is that it has very little with which to uh, uphold its power. Mm -hmm. uh, Soviet Union is in better shape to, much better to shape uphold than its they interests have than we are. The Soviet Union is a regional power. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has uh, something on the order of 20 divisions marshaled uh, in the region uh, mm -hmm. of Central Asia and, and Afghanistan. And the United States has uh, a nascent RDF, which is not particularly a, a an impressive force, force at the moment. Yes. Right. Or right. as I heard it described, uh, a rapidly deplorable force. Okay. Well, we'll leave that alone. Thank you. Robin? Mr. Ambassador, you heard uh, Karen, Karen Elliott House say that the states neighboring um, Iraq, the Gulf states, and she named them, fear that this is going to mean the spread of your revolution into their, or at least militant Shiite Muslim spirit into their countries. Are they right to fear that? I mean, is that what you will now attempt to do? No. I think most of the interpretations presented by the gentleman uh, are not correct. Uh, the problem is that you have got access to a lot of information, but when you come to the interpretation, the, uh, the whole issue changes. Uh, I am sure you remember that all the what you have foreseen about the future of Iran, even before the revolution, around the time of the collapse of the of the Shah's regime onward, all of those uh, uh, things happen to be false. This is simply because uh, those who interpret the information they do not have access to some of the clues. What is the and correct interpretation? The correct interpretation is reference to Islam and to the Holy Quran, which is very difficult for some of the learned scholars in this part of the world. Uh, for instance, they put their fingers up on the Sunni Shia issue. It is absolutely irrelevant. We have a good number of Sunni brothers inside Iran who are defending their That is the homeland. other, the, the major sect the, in the, the world it, of the see, Muslim faith. It is faith. not a sectarian yeah. issue. They, they are, we believe and we think it is quite justified to believe so, that even raising up this issue, flaring up this issue, is in itself an instigation and probably a sort of, uh, you know, a kind conspiracy. Let me ask Mr. Olson. We have Shiites and Sunnis in Iran. They have both members in the parliament, and they are working hand in hand. We, we speak in terms of Islam, neither Shia nor Sunni. And mind you, the Sunni brothers inside the other countries around us are very happy to practice their Islam, and they are looking forward to that. If the impact of the revolution has resulted in a sort of political awareness or religious awareness, or both in the area, it is inevitable. Religion is something innate. People want it. They have been Muslims for years, and they want to be Muslims. Well, we cannot be blamed for that. Let me ask uh, Ms. House whether the states she has been visiting recently see it that way. How do they see it? Well, the Iraqis would make the same point he does that uh, in defense of their own uh, very sharp division between numbers of Shias and Sunnis that, that uh, uh, whatever they are, whether Shia or Sunni, that they are Iraqi first. Now, that's not exactly the way the uh, Saudis look at it. They're much more concerned uh, and their, their Shia population is very small, about 250,000 out of four million, uh, four and a half million Saudis. But they're still very concerned about that, and they're very concerned about the Shia population in Bahrain, the appeal of the Iranian effort to try to stir up these uh, minorities, which was going on. It's one of the reasons that which they fear would, the excuse war. me, which they fear would might result in the overthrow of their rather conservative regimes. Is that? Uh, 
Is that what you mean? Yes, that you could generate something that spins out of control. Are you not interested in over in uh, subverting and, uh, and exporting your revolution to we those countries? We are not interested in any intervention, overt or covert, in the affairs of our neighbors, mm -hmm. our brothers and sisters in the Persian Gulf area. So they don't have the anything Muslims. to worry about in your view? They have something to worry about. What is that? That is that they know what they have done to President Saddam Hussein in terms of supporting him in the war against us. If this worries them, this is not very significant. We have always extended our hand to them for friendship. They can always shake it. We are ready. We are not going to have any territorial ambition, any aggression against any of these states. We are Muslims. We speak in the, the language of the Holy Quran. They have the same language and we can communicate very easily. If some of the regimes are worried by what their own people might wish to do against them or for them, that is their own business. Let me ask Mr. Olson, would that kind of declaration from Iran, Mr. Olson, uh, relieve the anxieties of U.S. policymakers in the area? Or, I mean, concerned with the area? I don't think so. I mean, what we're dealing here with is, is an excellent case of uh, revolutionary double, th double talk um, in that uh, you assure people that you don't intend to interfere in their country, but promote a transnational idea that is guaranteed uh, to stir up local populations. And the Iranians at the moment are in the process of building a number of radio stations. I think the number is somewhere over 150, um, with facilities to broadcast throughout the Middle East in a variety of languages, which they are in the process of doing, spreading the uh, Islamic uh, revolution or their idea of the Islamic revolution. And any number of, uh, of the leaders of the country have talked about the fact that you cannot contain the revolution. It's like spring weather. It spreads uh, uh, abroad as it is. And the states in the region, of course, are going to review, review this as uh, interference in their affairs, as the Iranians would uh, regard it as interference in their affairs if the local regimes broadcast into Iran to let's threaten get, their Let's their get the ambassador's comment on that. I think the, the impact of the revolution... I mean, are you, are you, in fact, installing all these radio stations oh, to do that? I think uh, you have installed plenty of radio stations and you broadcast in many languages. No, but I mean, are you? Oh, to answer all Mr. people Wilson's do point. it. Yes, we, we mm -hmm. uh, uh, have different languages on our radio and we preach, we have press, uh, we have uh, uh, TV and people are quite free to listen to us. Uh, the problem is what we are teaching or preaching in our radio stations and through our media is not something contrary to the principles of the belief of the people. We don't want them to uh, uh, overthrow their regimes. We just teach them the principles of the Holy Quran. We have to leave it there, Mr. Ambassador. Thank yes. you very much for joining us. That's the end of our time tonight. Uh, Karen Elliott House, Mr. Olson, thank you for joining us. Good night, Jim. Good night, Robin. That's all for tonight. We will be back tomorrow night. I'm Robert McNeil. Good night. For a transcript, send $2 to the McNeil Lehrer Report, Box 345, New York, New York, 10101. The McNeil Lehrer Report was produced by WNET and WETA. They are solely responsible for its content. Funding for this program has been provided by this station and other public television stations, and by grants from Exxon Corporation, and AT&T and the Bell System Company.